My name is Bob Ratman, attorney at Rat Law. Today, I'm gonna educate you on some strange laws from around the world so that you don't fall prey to them. Or, you know, just try to entertain you for a little while. Most of these are kind of silly. I skipped some of the more famous ones, like it being illegal to have an ice cream cone in your back pocket in Alabama, or handling salmon in suspicious circumstances in the UK. I could also probably do a whole video on Singapore. So let's get going with the jurisprudence shenanigans. Our first law takes us to the quaint little French town of Chateauneuf du Pape. By the way, Chateauneuf du Pape translates to Pope's New Castle, which is the big building in the middle. Look, it was new in the 1300s and only one Pope lived there. Go easy on it. But forget about the Pope Palace because what we are worried about happened in the 1950s. Because in 1954, they passed one of the most xenophobic laws I have ever heard of. The first section of this law states, the overflight, the landing, and the takeoff of aircraft known as flying saucers or flying cigars, whatever their nationality is, are prohibited on the territory of the community. That's right, they banned aliens. The law also goes on to give the city police and forest officers the ability to seize the alien spacecraft. How are they supposed to do that? I don't know. You might be sitting there thinking, is this yet another case of the French getting ergot in their bread? Well, there's no hard evidence of that, but the law was a reaction to a wave of UFO sightings in the area, including one guy that claimed to see little men in spacesuits in his yard. France seems like a dangerous place for aliens to go walking around. Usually when the French find strange creatures in their yard, they cook them in butter. Officially, the reason for making this law was to protect the local vineyards from aliens and people trying to look for aliens. There is also a pretty good chance it was a publicity stunt. Some of my information for this came from a New York Times clipping from the time, so it probably worked to some extent. Next law. Next, we got one that may surprise my European viewers. If you were to ask an American if they like black currant, they would probably respond, What the hell is that? For those that don't know, black currant is a berry that is pretty common in Europe and parts of Asia. It kind of tastes like a cross between a cherry and a grape, but with more acidity. It is actually a pretty common flavor for sweet things in Europe. In the UK, Skittles are actually black currant flavored instead of grape. However, black currant was banned in the US in 1912. You may be thinking, What, did an American kid choke on a black currant like the Kinder Eggs? But no, they actually had a good reason this time. You see, blackcurrant, the other currants, and gooseberries belong to a group called ribes. Ribes are a secondary host for white pine blister rust, which is a fungus that can kill some species of pine trees. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture effectively banned ribes in the U.S. to protect the U.S. lumber industry as part of the Plant Quarantine Act of 1912. The white pine blister rust is not as much of an issue in Europe and Asia because a lot of the pine trees there are resistant. In the 1960s, though, the federal government lifted the ban on ribes thanks to the Forest Service's work on breeding resistance into their pine trees. However, state bans took longer to be repealed. Many bans lasted into the 2000s, and some still aren't repealed. There are also still some federal restrictions on what countries the plants can be imported from. Despite black currants' newfound legality, it hasn't recovered as a consumer product in the U.S. Being banned for decades means that it largely fell out of the public consciousness. It was replaced with local fruits and easily attainable tropical fruits. You can find some black currant products in the U.S., mostly jam and jelly, but nowhere near the selection of commercial products that there are in Europe. If you go on Amazon in the U.S. and search black currant, most of what you get is imported things like Rabina selling for $19 for 1.5 liters. I did find some black currant twinnings tea, which I will report my findings on on social media when it shows up. Next law. Next up, we are going to China. In 2016, China's Ministry of Culture created an interesting regulation for live streaming sites. They restricted eating bananas on stream. What kind of monkey business is this, you might ask? The answer is pretty simple. Porn is not legal in China. In fact, the Chinese government has likened porn to spiritual pollution. It is also legal in most Asian countries. This map shows places where it is legal in green, yellow has restrictions, or is in a gray area, and red is illegal. Granted, China does have a porn industry, but it exists underground and in loopholes. So because of this, many enterprising ladies were streaming themselves eating bananas slowly to screens in goon caves across China. In recent years, though, they have gotten even stricter on live streams. The new rules include broad statements like illegal or vulgar content cannot be spread. They also have to dress and speak appropriately, again, a very loose term. I imagine this allows them to get rid of anyone they find at all inappropriate at this point. They do have one good rule, though, and that is if you make content that gives things like medical advice or financial advice in China, you have to be licensed. I have lightly touched on medical things in some of my videos, but never in an advice way. That's not ethical. I have an associate's in funeral science. I'm not an expert in anything. I just like reading and learning and telling people about what I found. My goal is just to make interesting videos that make people laugh. Let's be real. 99% of creators should not be aiming much higher than that. If you need life advice, Advice that is more life altering than what cars you should test drive? Go find a real life professional. Finance and medical content is full of scammers at this point. How there are people like CoffeeZilla and How to Cook That who have whole careers talking about the dumb shit people try to push on their viewers. China has some bad things going on, but there are a few things I think we could learn from them. Cracking down on at least the notable online scammers is one of them. Next law. 
Next up, we have Quentin Tarantino's least favorite law. In 2009, Greece banned wearing high heels at certain historical sites like the Acropolis. This is another one that has a good reason. High heels are more likely to damage floors than other common types of shoes. This is mainly due to the wearer's weight being distributed over a smaller area. This makes them much more likely to scratch, scuff, and dent floors. For instance, I found a Canadian study about stiletto heels and flooring. It says that linoleum can take about 75 psi and that vinyl tile can take about 200 psi. On the other hand, it measured the pressure exerted by heels worn by 12 of their co-workers. The heels exerted between 640 psi and over 2200 psi. I've also seen historical buildings in the U.S. that discourage high heels. I live in New Mexico and a lot of the older buildings here and in other mountain states have floors that are just boards made out of the nearest pine trees over joists. I have heard multiple stories over the years of people wearing high heels, stepping just right, and their heel pops the knot out of the historic building's floor. Not only does this damage the building, it is also possible that it will hurt the wearer. It is not a law, but it is something to keep in mind, and some buildings do request that people don't wear high heels to save the floors. It also seems like a very reasonable law, especially in a country whose economy relies heavily on its historic buildings. The Greece law also had a second part where they banned food and drink in these historic areas as well. When I was looking into this, I saw a report from around this time where they removed over 60 pounds of chewing gum from under the seats of the over 1,800-year-old theater, the Odeon of Herodes Atticus. There's also an ongoing issue all over the world that one of the best ways to get people interested in history is getting them to see historic places. But this is also one of the worst things for historic places. Many historical sites have been damaged in the world, either intentionally or accidentally, by people visiting them. So please, whenever you go to a historic place, try to be careful so that many more generations can see it. Next law! But your roads are world of tanks. In the United Kingdom, you can legally drive a tank on the road. Surprisingly, this is not really allowed in the US. There might be some local law I didn't find, but at least in general, that is true. You can own tanks in the US, but you cannot drive them on the road. There are plenty of places that let you drive tanks in the US, but you have to stay on private property. There are also tank-like things you can drive on the road in the US, like the ferret and some other armored vehicles with tires. But in the UK, you can can have a full-on tanky boy with tracks and drive it down to Nando's. There are a few rules you have to follow if you want to rommel about the English countryside, however. Obviously, the first one is the gun has to be disabled. It looks like a common way to do this is to fill the gun with concrete. Also, it is called a gun on tanks from what I found. Apparently, in the modern military, cannons are rifled and a lot of times are artillery that fires in an arc to hit things beyond eyesight, where tanks have smoothbore guns that shoot directly at things. You also have to put rubber shoes on the tracks so it does not hurt the road. The tank you pick also has to be less than 2.9 meters wide and less than 44 metric tons. By the way, a metric ton is a thousand kilos as opposed to the 2,000 pounds used in the US. The conversion is a metric ton is about 1.1 freedom tons. Also, the width restriction prevents the coolest British tank from being street legal. You also need to get an H-class driver's license that allows you to drive track vehicles. Obviously, tanks are outnumbered by Vauxhall Astros in the UK, but it is interesting nonetheless, especially considering how narrow many of the roads are there. Look at how big a normal American truck looks on the country roads there. Overall, pretty surprising, since I thought the only thing they tanked over there was their economy by leaving the EU. Next law. Finally, we are going to the exotic land of cheese and alcoholism. Wisconsin. In the United States, there are laws known as employees right to know laws or just right to know laws. In simple terms, these laws require employers to provide information to their workers about any dangers in the workplace. Wisconsin's version of this law has an interesting provision. Under the part of the law that deals with toxic substances, it lists what is not included as a toxic substance that needs to be disclosed. Most of these lines relate to federal rules or say things like substances that stay in a sealed package do not have to be disclosed. But then you get to the bottom of it and it just says, Ludafisk. If you are not from Wisconsin, Minnesota, or one of the Nordic countries, there's a pretty good chance you haven't heard this word before. You see, Ludafisk is a traditional dish in the Nordic countries that is dried whitefish, like cod, that is then soaked in lye. Yes, that lye, the one used in soap making, the stuff they burn people with in Fight Club. Lutefisk is a horrifyingly gelatinous dish that smells awful. This line makes it so employers do not have to warn their employees about working with it, even though they would have to warn them about working with lye. Lutefisk is a fairly common food in Wisconsin and Minnesota due to a lot of immigrants from Norway settling there in the 1800s because it reminded them of their homeland. Cold and wet. It is bizarre to me to carve out a special exception for lutefisk at the potential risk of employee safety. Traditional foods are a great way to continue your heritage, but there are better Norwegian foods that don't require chemical exposure. My grandmother used to make another Norwegian food called lefse, and it is delicious. It's kind of like a potato tortilla. And if you slap some butter and some sugar on that bitch, you're going to have a great time. Remember, kids, say no to lutefisk. That's all I have for you today. Socials and additional reading are in the description, and I hope you have a great day and eat something good.